Love will never fail you. It is the most powerful force in the universe because it is and always comes from God. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. What do you say, church? Well, happy Sabbath. It's good to see all of you here. It's good to see some of our college students and academy students back with us this morning. Um, I'm sure on behalf of the parents, we're really glad, and all of us, we're really glad that you're here and um, you're missed when you're down doing school, but we know the Lord is blessing you there. Strange times we're living in, isn't it? Incredible how much one week of change can bring. Two years ago, our world was on the verge of shutting down due to a virus at this time of year. And we've walked through that. The Lord has carried us through that mercifully. Over those last two years in the U.S., we've had fires at a scale that um, broke records. We had freak natural disasters. It's probably the best way that people have described it. We have seen that Jesus is coming soon. And now we see in Ukraine, I think it's one of the largest landmass countries in Europe outside of Russia. People who have chosen to move towards a more free and equitable society under attack by a neighboring country. An unprovoked, uncalled for attack. In Ukraine, there are, you heard earlier on the video, over 40,000 Seventh day Adventists. There's many, many more Christians. There's uh, over 700 churches that are Adventists in Ukraine. A lot of our brothers and sisters today have taken the day to fast and pray, and we will have time for prayer later in this sermon. As a church, we're going to pray for two things later in this sermon before we conclude, and that will be that God will have mercy and hold back the winds of strife, that He'll protect our brothers and sisters over in Ukraine, and secondly, that God will move in a mighty way through this series so that we can leave this broken planet and go home. I want to go home. How about you? Tired of hearing about war, seeing carnage on the news. In Matthew 24, take your Bibles and turn to that wonderful passage here. It's not for our sermon, but it's very important to be reminded of as we watch what's happening in the world around us. It's two verses I want us to look at, then we will pray, and then we'll begin our, our sermon this morning. Matthew chapter 24. You know this probably quite well. Some of you may know this verse quite well, but it is so vital to be reminded of as we see what's happening in our world around us. When you're there, let the preacher know by saying amen. Notice what Christ speaking to his disciples says. Read it with me aloud. We might have different translations. That's okay. Let's read this together. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom, keeping on reading with me aloud, will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. When the gospel has been shared with the world, that's when Christ says we go home. I want to go home, don't you? How vitally important it is, the series of meetings that are coming up, how critical they are at this time in, in earth's history. Go with me to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, verse 28. Actually, let's start in verse 25, and then we'll jump down to 28. Luke chapter 21, verse 25, when you're there, if you'll say amen. Notice what it says, verse 25, and there will be signs in the what? Sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, what? Do we see that happening today? 
with perplexity. It's interesting. I would not want to be the president of the United States right now. How do you win? And no, don't, don't answer that because that turns into a political debate. Okay? The perplexities we see right now. The sea and the waves roaring. Verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and the expectations of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they'll see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Just pause there, church. We don't have to fear because our God is coming with power and He will set it right. What do you say? Now, verse 28, when these things begin to happen, do what? You've heard us talk about this before, but we need to be reminded. Don't look down in discouragement or at your phone in, in an addicted fear at the news about what's going on. Look where? Because why? Your redemption draws near. Today, we are a day closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ. He is coming. These are not cunningly devised fables. These aren't things that we just feel good about. I appreciated the video. For those of you who are here during the pre prelim videos that we show before the service starts, we had the president of uh, Hope Channel giving an update there. And he said, um, one, he said, the second coming, Jesus is coming soon. We believe that. But the second thing he said, and I thought this was so interesting, he says, and I'm going to paraphrase, but basically he said, when you see, you, we talk about wars and rumors of wars and these being signs, but it's a whole other thing when it's actually happening to you. Jesus is coming soon. Are we ready for his coming? Our story today is finishing off our series on Elijah. We're going to talk about how personally we need to prepare for the coming of Christ. And before we begin, we need to pray and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. Please bow your heads with me as we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we bow before your throne here in this sanctuary, in a few moments we'll be spending some time meditating on your word. We ask that Jesus will speak to our hearts. We ask that you'll banish Satan and angels from having any access to this place and that you will fill this place with your angels. Father, we ask that you will bring a deep converting influence upon our lives. Because we want to be ready when Jesus comes. We want to be a part of hastening his coming. And just like the disciples, so we need today. They could only take the gospel with power when the Holy Spirit fell on them. And we need that today. So we ask that you'll fall upon us. And anoint us. In Jesus' name, amen. First King chapter 18. By way of reminder, last week we saw that Elijah stood alone against 850 prophets. 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of, of the other gods there, 850 prophets there. And then the huge, vast multitude of the children of Israel, and not one person was willing to stand up and say, God is God. They were waiting for the showdown to make up their minds. First the prophets went about and did their incantations and their dancing and gouged themselves and had blood coming forth from them. And they were trying to force their God to respond and we saw that any time that we aren't walking with God and we're trying to do things in our own way, it requires a lot more work and effort on our part. But when we let God do the work, He does it in His strength and we can rest in what He does. And we saw that with Elijah. Elijah comes to that critical point. He's standing there. The prophets have finally, the other prophets have finally pulled away. 
And Elijah just gets down and he prays simply. And no sooner had his prayer ants ended, short, faith-filled prayer, the fire fell and consumed the sacrifice. How many times did Elijah need to pray for the fire to fall? It's not a trick question. How many times did he pray? Once. Then the fire fell. He gets up. He has them seize the prophets of Baal. All 850 are taken down and they're executed there. And then Elijah, verse 41, 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 41. When you're there, if you'd say amen. I'll give you a moment to turn there. I hear some pages turning. 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 41. You want to see this in your Bibles. 2 Kings 18 and verse 41. Are you there? Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the what? Of abundance of rain. Was there any cloud, were there any clouds in the sky at this point? We know that later on in the story because Elijah goes and he's bowing before God and it takes seven times of him praying before the clouds show up. So the question is, did Elijah hear physically the sound of an abundance of rain, yes or no? What was he, what was he hearing through the ear of physical or the ear of faith? He's listening by faith. God has promised to send the rain when the people have chosen him. The people have made their choice. And now Elijah is taking the step forward and he's saying, God, I know you're going to come through on your promises. You've promised for an abundance of rain. And so we're going to kneel down here. We're going to pray and we're going to see your rain come. And, and, and so he speaks not reality. He speaks faith about what God will do to reality and that God will fulfill his promises. Church, we need to speak more faith in what God can and will do. A lot of times we talk about what we can see instead of what God promises he will do. We see someone and they're broken and they, we, we don't see how they're going to ever change. And, and the reality is, if we look at someone and we say, you know what, that person just is never going to change. And we look at that, yeah, the fact... If you, if you were to go to look at the studies, most people who, who, are, who are in different phases of their life, the studies say they won't change. But we don't listen to studies, we listen to what God is going to do. And God takes a broken person and He can transform that person into a, a new creature that, that is no longer broken but is transformed by the Spirit of God. Think of the two demoniacs that met Christ. If, if, if you had been... Someone looking at these men who had no clothes on, were wearing shackles, and had scars all over their bodies from their own self-mutilation. Would you have been someone that says, yeah, that's a good candidate to show that that, that person's going to change? If you were speaking humanly, the answer would have been no. And in fact, the disciples, when they saw those demoniacs coming, what did they do? They turned around and did what? They ran. But Jesus understood and saw with the eye of faith that God can change anyone who allows him to change them. There's no one that God cannot change. And so, he stands there and the men come and he hears what they can't say. They want help, but demons say the opposite through their lips. And Christ rebukes the spirits, they leave. And the men are then seen clothed and in their right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus. Church, as we go into evangelism, we need to talk and look at what God is going to do. And I am, I am speaking right now very much to myself and the, whatever the Lord impresses on your heart, let Him take that with you. Humanly speaking, it would be difficult to see what God is going to do, but God has promised that his word will not return unto him void. What do you say? He has promised that he will do when we step out in faith and do his work, that the results are no longer our problem, but his. And God is good at following through on his word. He always will. 
And so when Elijah says, I hear the abundance of rain, he is not talking by what he physically is hearing. He is talking faith. And he's saying, I hear the rain is going to come. Because I know God's going to do what he's promised to do. So Ahab goes and does his thing. But Elijah does the most important piece of preparing for God to move that his people can do. Elijah goes and prays. Verse 42 of 1 Kings chapter 18. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Now the king should have been praying with him, but Ahab, that's a different story. Then he bowed down, Elijah bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, go up now and look towards the sea. So he went up and he looked and said, there is what, church? Nothing. And seven times he said, go again. Elijah gets down and he prays. And after he prays, he tells the servant, go look, can you see a cloud? And the servant runs over and he looks and he sees and, and the sky is as barren of clouds as it's been for the last three and a half years. And so he comes back, he says, there's nothing. And Elijah goes and he bows before the king of the universe and he says, God, please send the rain. And he sends his servant and his servant runs and he looks and he sees nothing. And this happens six times. Why? Why did God have Elijah pray multiple times before the rain came. Have you ever felt like you've prayed for something over and over again and nothing seems to happen? You've prayed maybe for God to move in someone's life that you care about and nothing happens. Pray for a family member, a friend, and it seems that nothing's happening. Or you've prayed for a financial situation to be resolved. You've prayed for, for something else to be done. And, and, and I understand there, there are multiple ways that God can answer prayer. One, God does not force anyone to follow Him. You follow what I'm saying, church? So when I pray for a family member, God doesn't take away their freedom of choice, but it does allow God to move in unique ways in their lives that He wouldn't have moved otherwise without us interceding for Him to do that. He wouldn't have been able to move otherwise without our requests. Sometimes God says to our prayers, no, because this is better. But other times God has us come repeatedly before His throne before He answers because church... I am in the way of what God wants to do. There's a fascinating paragraph I came across. In the Bible Commentary, Volume 2, page 1035, paragraph 2. You also refine this in an old uh, periodical called the Review and Herald, May 26, 1891. Review and Herald, May 26, 1891. Notice what... This author says, the servant watched while Elijah prayed. Six times he returned from the watch saying, there is nothing, no clouds, no sign of rain. But the prophet did not give up in discouragement. He kept reviewing his life to see where he had failed to honor God. He confessed his sins. He did what, church? He did what? He confessed his what? His sins and thus continued to afflict his soul before God while watching for a token that his prayer was answered. Now notice this. As he searched his heart, he seemed to be less and less, both in his own estimation and in the sight of God. It seemed to him that he was nothing and that God was everything. That's where we need to come down. When I finally arrived at the place where Jesus is everything, and my own human strength becomes nothing because I can't do anything without Jesus. Church, do you believe that? 
You see, after Mount Carmel, Elijah had, be, had had a little bit of that self-dependence begin to creep back into his life. He was, according to James, a man like any one of us. I mean, I think you probably would have had that if you had just showed it to the whole nation. And every time he bowed down before God, he became a little less, and God became a little more. Until finally, all of what was self in his life was fully removed. And Jesus had finally become everything. And then it was that God could move. It seemed to him that he was nothing and God was everything. And when he reached the point of renouncing self, while well, he clung to the Savior... In his only strength and, as his only strength and righteousness, the answer came. On that seventh time, the servant appeared and said, Behold, there riseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hands. Church, here's the point. Success in our evangelistic series. Success in your own personal spiritual walk. Success in any area of your life will only happen, true success, will only happen when you stay before God on your knees until God becomes everything and we become nothing. It was when he finally looked away from himself and only saw Jesus, that's when the rain came. See, his danger was that he would look to his human weakness instead of to the divine arm of God, and there was not a single thing that Elijah could do to make the rain come. He was all God and God alone. Notice verse 44 as we continue, we finish our passage here and come to our conclusion. Then it came to pass on the seventh time that he said, There is cloud. There is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. Said good. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. What a man of faith. All he needed was a cloud and he knew God was going to move. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the land, hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. He girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. What a man of faith. Right? Elijah finally becomes nothing, and now this man who has humiliated a king who has been in rebellion against God shows that he still honors the monarch in his position. And he goes in front of the chariot, and he runs the horses of Ahab right back to his place of dwelling. Now that is a man of love and humility. Oh, that we might be more like those, that kind of person. What do you say, church? Coming to the place where God is everything and man is nothing. When we arrive there as a church, God will do great and mighty things. Do you want to see God move in your life? I know I do. So church, we're going to do something like we did last week, once more again this week. We're going to take time to pray as a church. And we're going to plead for God to move in our lives, move to bring us to the place of full surrender and full realization of His might, His love, his grace and his power. We're also going to pray for Ukraine. I want to appeal to you to come back tonight at 6 where we're going to have an earnest time of prayer as a church. But right now, turn to the person next to you. If you're able to kneel together, kneel. And let's seek the Lord in prayer as Elijah did on Mount Carmel, asking him to move in a mighty way in our lives to teach us how to fully surrender to Him, to protect those, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, and to show us 
Jesus, only Jesus. Let's pray now. Father in heaven, as we bow in this place, you've heard our prayers. We want more love in our lives for you. We want to be taught and seen clearly and to live where every choice we make, every desire we have, is baptized in the love of Jesus. Father, you know I need that. You know my brothers and sisters that are here need this. Oh, may you move in our homes and in our lives. And as we think of the campaign that's coming, oh, Father, fill us with your Spirit. Pour out upon each of us the holiness and love that we so much need. Father, we think of the war that's going on in Ukraine right now. Our hearts ache because we see death and destruction on, on so many fronts there. Oh, Father, we ask that you will have mercy upon our planet, that you will hold back the winds of strife just a little longer. That you will overrule the 
intentions of Satan and that you will protect this these your people. I think of our Adventist brothers and sisters and our Christian brother and sisters that are over there. Protect them. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing our closing hymn, Sweet Our Prayer. Thank you for the sweet hour of prayer. Thank you for the personal and intimate relationship we can have with you. Oh God, we pray that you will help us to learn how to pray and how to seek your face. How to do that first work and build a relationship with you, putting aside ourselves 
and seeking Jesus and Him only. We ask that you'll bless every man, woman, boy, and girl that's here. May you bless our homes. May you bless the work of our hands. Father, most of all, may you teach us how to love you with all our hearts. We lay ourselves here into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I have just a couple of brief announcements before the speaker will dismiss you. First, I'd like to remind you that uh, we have a going away dinner uh, for Dina, and that will be downstairs, and encourage you to come if you're able. Um, secondly, I would like to um, remind you that tonight at 6 o'clock, what time? We're going to be praying together here. Church, come. See what God is going to do as we seek His face. And uh, then I'd also like to remind you to be praying for the series. We have more things to pass out. If you're convicted or want to pass out some more cards to businesses, please take them. I know God will use them. God bless you. Happy Sabbath and have a good week.